Hey there folks, Professor G here, and today we're going to talk about, yep, you guessed it, glaciers. Um, I don't know what you thought about or think about or picture in your mind uh, when you hear the word glacier. Um, could be somebody hiking across a giant ice sheet in, in Antarctica. Um, uh, in my mind, it's a giant wall of ice um, high as the eye can see and uh, I always picture a glacier um, maybe because of my uh, the field I study like historical geology I always picture a glacier as, as uh, man or animals being you know at the at the front of it um, and uh, living in the area and the land where it's melting out so if we were to come up to a glacier uh, we'd picture I'd picture this this uh, thousands foot high um, wall of, of ice in every direction um, but that's just just me and and you guys you know maybe uh, having watched the, uh, the Ice Age cartoons maybe you got another idea um, but what I can probably almost guarantee is that you never saw this and thought of a glacier okay and um, that's really you know a large part of what how we're going to be referring to these it's almost like a river of ice now it is unbelievably thick and and unbelievably long um, oftentimes this is a uh, an alpine glacier we're differentiating in that manner um, but uh, there's 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 continental type glaciers and there's alpine glaciers um what i was talking about in the beginning these giant 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 ice sheets uh, those are the the continental type the the type that used to reach from the north pole all the way down to um all the way down to to new york ohio uh across to illinois wisconsin it just just massive wall of ice okay um, that's completely different than this this alpine type but we're gonna talk in a large part about about these guys here all right alrighty so and here's another view much closer I suppose and again here's that glacier snaking through this this what used to be a valley here um, and it really does just look like a river of ice or snow um, it's really hard to gauge scale, okay? But um, you know, it's a, we could guess it's it's pretty darn good, good size scale. So we're going to spend some time talking about how you get glaciers in the first place, all right? And the simple matter of it all is, is you've got to build up snow for a very, 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 very long time. And uh, so we take this as an opportunity to remind you that pretty much no matter where you are on the earth uh, you've got a pretty good chance of having some snow as long as you go up high enough all right you see here even at the equator you go up high enough you're going to see some snow and latitudinally you know as we move to the well in this case I moved to the south here or to the north where we are um, we're somewhere right around here I suppose latitudinally um, I forget our exact latitude actually but um, echo what is the latitude and longitude of Utica New York the latitude for Utica New York is 43.096 yeah, I was close 43.096 so I, I had it right around here uh, if this is 30 and that's 60 uh, that's probably 50 if well you know what we're right around there uh, sometimes it feels like we're up here was gonna be the joke I was gonna make okay but uh, in reality we're we're down oop here um, but this is permanent snow okay we're not talking about seasonal um, so the idea is is year after year after year you need to build up snow and what I, the implication here is is that the farther north or south you are the easier that is to to do all right so what happens to the snow as it builds up this is another one of those pictures that was meant to be vertical but it really wasn't very large so 
Um, we turned it sideways. We'll see it the right way round in a moment. Um, we move from just snow, what we'll call loose snow, okay, to granular snow, to fern, to fine-grained ice, to coarse-grained ice. And, and what's happening here, um, you see there's a, a bit of a scale, but this could even happen in a, in a winter time. Um, I always joke about the driveway glaciers. We get them at the end of our driveway. Um, you know how long it takes those piles of snow at the bottom of your driveway to melt. Um, so what happens is these, these beautiful little snowflakes, as they melt a little bit, and it doesn't take much heat to do that, they get more compact, and then they turn into these, these little snow ice balls. That's what a fern fern is. And then those snow ice balls uh, turned into smaller ice, and then that ice builds into harder ice. And again, just lastly, point out, um, you know, as I, I joke that this can happen uh, over a winter here in Utica, um, in, in the real world, we're looking at, at a good chunk of time. Um, you might hear folks, especially when they're talking about global warming and whatnot, um, talking about looking at uh, ice core samples, okay, when they want to talk about um, carbon dioxide levels or, or so on and so forth. And uh, you're, you're maybe wondering, you know, how do they get records so far back? How do they know what the heck is, is going on? Well, you see, oops, hmm. there we go. You see um, that it's very... This doesn't show you that it's very common, but you, you trust me in this case. Um, it is, it, we've got a very old ice, okay? Um, and what happens is, is this ice is compacting and forming. There's still air bubbles in it. And they're taking samples of those air bubbles uh, that were trapped in the ice over the thousands and thousands of, of years that it was filling up. So that's where they're getting that data from. Just as a little side note there. And again, here's here's the image. Um, I told you we'd see it again. So we go from snowflakes to, to granular snow. I'm sorry, to slightly meltier snowflakes, to granular snow, to fern, to glacial ice. Okay. All right, speaking of letting stuff build up, permafrost. Permafrost is a layer of the soil that is always frozen. Okay? Always frozen. Um, they split it into two sections here, continuous and discontinuous. And of course, again, it's latitudinal. Latitudinal. Um, and this is hopefully what you would expect. The further north you go, where's my mouse? The further north you go, um, you get to an area where it's almost always frozen. I'm sure you could carry this across into Siberia as well there, uh, across to Asia and Europe. Um, Discontinuous means that there is some seasonal melt, okay, a little bit here and there. Uh, alpine permafrost over here talks about um, the tops of mountains. Anytime you hear alpine anything, um, that's geology talk for mountain. And then I think this is neat. Um, I was just talking to you about uh, my, what I picture when I hear the word glacier, okay. Uh, and I mentioned that the glaciers came all the way down to New York State, Ohio, New Michigan, Wisconsin, all the way across there. I think I said Illinois or Indiana. Um, and they did, okay, all the way down into to Massachusetts, all the way over here was all glaciated. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so uh, understandably then in front of that, you're going to have a permafrost region now, or then, I'm sorry. And this marks that old perimeter. So you see the Great Lakes here for reference. Uh, maybe you could recognize your bays over here. The map's kind of small, but pretty dang far south. All right, so how does the ice flow? Um, glacial ice isn't exactly a liquid, all right, but it does, it turns over a little bit. Um, picture eh, pudding sliding down a hill, I can't, a slope, I don't know. Um, Jello's too thick, pudding's too thin. Uh, there is a little bit of overturn in this, though. And um, 
the bottom slides along. Okay, uh, the Earth's heat keeps uh, down here a little melty, and as such, it's able to to be all slick and slide down the hill. But additionally, there is, and here's the word for it, plastic flow. All right, you see how uh, they pretended to drill a hole right here. Okay, and what they're showing you is uh, how that hole would look if you put a bendy tube in it, perhaps, and as it moved forward over time, um, how uh, we do see some some movement in here. So it's weird. I don't I don't test you too much on this. It's it's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, it's probably not too surprising that the closer you get to the surface. Um, the colder it is, the more solid it is. So right here, you don't see hardly any bending at all. Uh, we're down here where you're in the middle. It's a little warmer, and it can do that, that overturning flow that I was talking about. So as it's slipping along down here, flowing a little bit here, up at the top, it's like, nah, uh-uh, I'm solid ice. I don't want to do that. Well, and to make up for that, to compensate for that, it ends up cracking up at the top. And we're going to have a word for those cracks in a little bit. Um, so, same idea here, really. All right. Changing gears just a bit to an anatomy of a glacier, okay? Anatomy of a glacier. Got a handful of vocabulary words here. And yeah, you could probably plan on having a diagram to label. All right, anatomy of a glacier. As I said, you could plan on a diagram about this uh, and a handful of vocabulary. So, what we got, first word is zone of accumulation. Guess what happens there? Yup, that's that uphill area where the snow builds up year after year after year after year. Okay, it accumulates. Uh, below that, we have the zone of ablation. And I, let me see here. I don't have it in here. I want to say I, I tend to use the word wastage there, zone of wastage, zone of ablation. I can try to remember to change it on the test. Um, but uh, just in your notes and parentheses, maybe put wastage there as well. Um, this is where you have the area of seasonal melt, okay? Um, and of course, the farther downhill you get, the more melt you're going to see. Um, to, to everything melts, to maybe just up here, you know, a little bit melts here and there. Um, but, you know, it's still snowing, but it comes and goes perhaps with the winter, with the seasons. In between those is the snow line or the fern line. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering different words in my head and not, they're not in my slides here. So the snow line or fern line, F-I-R-N. You might remember the word fern from um, our, our steps in the glacial ice process, okay? So that is the boundary line between um, the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation, all right? Between seasonal and permanent snow. All right, what else do we got? Uh, terminus, lovely word terminus here. That is the end of the glacier, the front bottom of the glacier is the terminus. All right. Zone of accumulation, zone of ablation, terminus. In case we don't cover it later, I think it has a slide, but in case we don't cover it later, um, let's talk briefly about icebergs. Okay. The term calving, calving um, is the process by which icebergs are made. When a glacier hangs off over a, uh, a water, area of water, all right, uh, pieces of it break off, again, in the melt, the sun, whatever, plop off and float around in the water there. They can be ginormous, they can be smaller, um, but the process that makes icebergs is called calving, all right, 
and now we've talked about it. So here's another view, pretty much the same view, I guess, but another diagram. This one's closer to my diagram, which you'll see in a moment. Zone of accumulation, snow line, zone of ablation or wastage, and terminus. And there's my lovely slug of a diagram. All right. Zone of accumulation, snow line or fern line, zone of ablation or wastage, terminus. Got it? Got it. All right. I told you we'd come back to the cracks on the top of the glaciers. Um, they're made when the glacier, the top of the glacier resists the flow that the middle and the bottom are doing. Uh, it's much colder up there, it's much more rigid, so the ice cracks. Those are called crevasses, okay? Um, you see them here, you see them there, um, and uh, I, I don't know why this sticks in my head so much. I guess my, my teacher way back when, um, crevasses are evil, nasty things. Um, they can be quite, quite deep, okay? And uh, the problem is, if you're walking along in this picture at any rate, you, you, you could see these, I would imagine. Um, the problem is, at least the way it was explained to me, is that uh, if you've had a fresh snowfall, let's say you're one of those crazy alpine hikers, okay, and you're out hiking a glacier somewhere, and uh, you wake up in the morning and there's a eh, foot of fresh snow. Well, you're not going to see these crevasses. And this picture is a little deceiving. These can be cracks several feet wide and Lord knows how, how deep. And the problem is if you fall into them, okay, um, it can be very tough to get out if you don't get knocked out, if you don't break a, a leg or an arm or, or whatever, God forbid. Um, they could be very, very difficult to get out of. All right, now it's unlikely that you'd be hiking up there alone and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, crevasses eat hikers. Okay, so be very, very careful if you're ever out hiking on top of a glacier and there's a fresh snow. Now, back to something much more useful. Um, they can indicate the direction of flow. All right, you, could, you can tell you've got some here, you've got some here, you've got some here. So if you're doing a little bit of aerial viewing, you can realize that this glacier is probably coming right down this way. And that might have been obvious anyhow, but they sort of outline the bends of the turn there. So crevasses. Um, not a whole lot helpful here. Just want to remind you that, that glaciers, uh, it's, it's, I don't think I use too many of the terms in here. Um, it's just a reminder that glaciers weather, which is breakdown, and erode, which is transport. Uh, tons and tons of sediment. Glaciers, and, and, and pardon the pun, I mean, these are the original snow plows, okay? Just, just monstrous things with, uh, they'll carve valleys, okay? They, they know no boundaries. Um, this much ice, this much mass, okay? They can push whatever they, through whatever they want and push whatever they want to out of the way. Uh, along the way, they, they grind up, um, pluck out, um, carve anything that gets in their way. And then at the very end, where they melt, out, melt away, they drop out all of that sediment. Okay, uh, We're in an area here in Utica, um, and, and again across in, in Ohio and PA and so on and so forth, where we were exposed to a lot of those meltwaters, and you get a lot of um, glacial deposits. You don't recognize them, and again, it's been a good 10,000 years um, since they left. So even if we hadn't reworked them in the last 30, 40, 50 years to build our roads and our shopping plazas and so on and so forth, around this area, because we get so much um, rain and, and whatnot, this stuff is vegetated for the most part, and you wouldn't be able to tell a glacial hill from a, a non-glacial hill unless you really knew what you were looking for. So, um, but it is around, and sometimes when you're out there uh, digging up some stuff in your yard, and and you find you know just an odd selection of of rocks, 
uh, in what should have just been normal soil. Sometimes that's the reason. And these giant boulders as well, okay, they, they call them erratics, E-R-R-A-T-I-C-S. Again, they should get a slide. I don't know if they did or not. Um, <clears throat> I don't deliver the Glacier's Lecture that incredibly often. It's a fun one, but we hardly ever get a chance to get to it. Um, these erratics, these giant boulders that are just, just monstrous, and you'll see them in the, um, as decoration in front of buildings and so on and so forth. Um, those were dropped down here by the, uh, by the glaciers. So, all right, switching gears again. There's, there's a whole bunch of randomness. Uh, glaciers is, is like many of the other topics we've talked about, something that if you were going on in college to be an actual geologist, you, you could take an entire semester on. So when we try to squeeze, um, something like this into one chapter, you know, one hour's worth of lecture, it, uh, it can seem like a whole bunch of randomness. So topography, uh, you hopefully know by now, is, is what the word we use when we want to talk about the lay of the land or how the land looks. Okay, So we have a mountain here, and we've got, oh, half a dozen plus glaciers uh, cutting through it. The next picture shows um, a time in the future when those glaciers are gone. Okay, So we have our, our mountain here. And we have a glacier that formed here and flowed down, a glacier that formed here and flowed down. You see here how a handful of smaller glaciers formed into one bigger one and flowed down. <coughs> so, vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. I guess the one we need to talk about is Cirque first. All right. I'm going to talk about a cirque first. Let me see if I have a picture of a cirque right here. I do. Beautiful. So a cirque is a steep-backed, steep-backed, bowl-shaped depression formed at the beginning of a glacier, or the head of a glacier. And what happens here? We talked about how um, the glaciers uh, build up. That zone of accumulation is uphill, okay, way uphill. Well, we're as uphill as you can get. And this flow process, this whole flowing thing starts here. And what it does is it, it just digs out. I guess this picture is the best. It digs out this back wall as it's sliding down. Um, it's like if you're... Yeah, playing baseball or something. I'm trying to think where there'd be dirt and you're running. And you go to push off, all right? And you've, you've got that just a little bit of, you're going to leave a little bit of a dent there, a divot, or if you're golfing, you grab some sod, all right? Um, it's just where the glacier's pushing off from. And, and again, over the thousands of years that it's there, it just digs this area out a whole lot more than it digs any of the others out, okay? So basically, even though they only have the word cirque here, this is a cirque, that's a cirque, that's a cirque, that's a cirque, all right? Anywhere the glacier starts, you're going to get a cirque, is my point. And all of these other words, for the most part, are functions of cirques. A rete, or a ret, however you want to pronounce it, I've been told it's French, um, is a very steep, narrow ridge between two um, glacial valleys, all right? I guess that's not really a function of a cirque, but um, a ret means a knife, I was told. But uh, let's see, we got an arete here somewhere. It's right here. Doesn't look very steep and narrow here because it's snow covered, but. So that's a long, narrow ridge. Okay, between two glacial valleys. Let's go back to cirques for a minute. Uh, a horn is uh, when you have a whole bunch of cirques around the top of a mountain. It leaves a rather steep, pointy um, back behind it. And here's one here. Here's one here. Okay, uh, you may have heard of the the Matterhorn. Okay, 
Uh, that's the mother's horn. Um, and uh, a horn is just a, an exceptionally pointy, glacially carved uh, mountaintop. But it's formed with several cirques back to back. Um, since I already talked about glacial valleys when we did a, a ret here, um, let's point out that glacial valleys are U-shaped. And why in heaven's name would you want to know that? Well, because stream valleys, the only other thing that carves valleys, are V-shaped. Uh, because of the way the water cuts in, um, the, the water cuts in at a very almost singular point all right like a knife through uh knife through butter is so cliche we'll say a knife through bread all right um there's that cutting point and then there's a little bit off to the sides where there's some damage done and that's how streams work glaciers though as i indicated a couple minutes ago the whole thing is a force all right so glaciers carve much different valleys um again we're looking at ten thousand years later in in most cases especially if you're this far south um, weathering, erosion, vegetation. Sometimes it's hard to tell one valley from another, but um, generally speaking, glaciers are U-shaped valleys where streams are V-shaped. And like we said, two of those valleys side by side will leave, will carve an arete or an arete. All right. Uh, over here, we've got hanging valley. Um, you've got a glacier that came down this way, but another one came this way and just carved off that uh, old glacial valley and left a very pretty waterfall. We've got a picture of one of those here in a minute. There's one. So the question is, is which glacier came first, the one that came this way or the one that came down this way? Of course, um, this one came first and this valley would have continued on through here. And then this one came through this is a great example of what I mean by it being vegetated. Okay, if you didn't know what you were looking at, no clue. Now, this is odd. Okay, you say, wow, that's a very sheer uh, wall, and, you know, it's going to look kind of odd. But, uh, again, it's not so vegetated up there, and you can see the the discord. But, uh, but yeah, just a random waterfall there, you know, a little draining stream um, that used to, many years before, just keep going straight down this way. So, Hanging Valley. All right, so just some random vocab uh, associated with, I suppose you would say, you know, weathering and erosion uh, caused by uh, glaciers. Weathering definitely is carving, okay? Uh, erosion would be the movement of all that material that it got out of the way. But uh, these are weathering features. A couple of them are functions of cirques. A couple of them are functions just of the valleys themselves. Because now we're switching gears again to talk about, oh, and it's time to stop my video.